worship, 6 o'clock Sunday evening, 7 on Wednesdays for our midweek Bible study. Our song service this morning, conducted by Brother John McDaniel, as usual, he is selected number two as our first song, number two. If you wish to turn to that and be ready or watch the screen above me at the appropriate time. Brother Jim Allen will lead our minds in prayer. Chad Dallahite will bring us the message of the hour, and Blake Wilson will conclude our service this morning in prayer. Before the closing prayer this morning, we'd ask you to be seated for a brief presentation by Brother Robert Edwards at that time. Remind you of those on our prayer list. We're glad to see Sister Reba Carroll here with us this morning. She's able to be out and about, and also Stephen Nolan is also be able is able to be here with us today. We're glad to see him and Robin, of course. Seth Hodges had oral surgery this past week, and he is at home recovering from that. You're also asked to remember Roy and Clara Jones. Mr. and Ms. Jones are good friends of Roger and Shirley. They're experiencing some health problems, and you're asked to remember them. Also, Roger or um, Richard and Shirley Smallwood have uh, been experiencing a lot of health difficulties, especially Shirley. She has back surgery scheduled for this coming Wednesday, April the 16th. If you have occasion to call and encourage her and Richard, be greatly appreciated. Joan Thurman has some eye surgery scheduled for April the 21st, she tells me. We also extend our sympathy to the mother or the family of the mother of one of Stephanie Hodges' students, Debbie Smith, who was killed in a car accident last week. Are there others that we should mention at this time? There's an egg hunt today after the morning service. Hopefully you've brought your own lunch and your plastic eggs immediately after morning worship service this morning. Concerning last the leaders and leaderettes, Johnny may have a few more things to say about this, but it's getting down to brass tacks. It's uh, late, later this week, right, Johnny? You're leaving Friday going to that event, but we have a flurry of activities in, in the meantime. Uh, for those that are working on the banner, please meet this afternoon at 3 o'clock in the Fellowship Hall. Anyone needing to work on Art Says It projects can come this time also. If you have any questions, please see Tammy. A uh, group picture for the last to leader participants after the morning worship service this morning. Meet down front for those that are participating for a group picture. If you wish to help us with the uh, filling up our pantry, get a brown bag in the foyer, help us with that on the continuous action. Group two has placed boxes in each classroom downstairs to be filled with the food pantry. If you can help us in that regard, that would be most appreciated. Group four, Mike and Cindy's group, meets in the fellowship hall after the evening service tonight. After the evening service, finger foods are the fair. Group two meets at Tanner's Beach next Saturday. That's Stephen and Lee's group. Sign up list in the foyer. Group one, Jake and Julie's group, meets at Little Tallapoosa Park Saturday, May the 3rd. Our gospel meeting begins two weeks from today. Two weeks from today. That's right, two weeks from today. The door knocking for those that have the opportunity to meet here with us will be two weeks from yesterday, Saturday, April the 26th. We'll meet here at the building and fan out and try to knock on every door in the city of Bremen. We need as much help as possible for that event, obviously, but that will be two weeks from yesterday, April the 26th, in preparation for our gospel meeting, which begins two weeks from today, April the 27th through May 1st. Brother Charles Blair will conduct our meeting. It's another meeting that begins today at the Piedmont Road Congregation in Marietta. Brother Phil Sanders, who you see on Channel 57 every Sunday morning, will be conducting that meeting. The next area-wide singing will be Friday, April 25th. That's uh, two weeks or a week from this coming Friday at West Georgia. The next project for Good Samaritans will be two weeks from today, April the 27th, Sunday, after the morning worship service in the Fellowship Hall. Would you bow with me, please? Holy Father, we're thankful that you've spared our lives to this hour. We're thankful that we have the measure of health that allows us to be here. We're thankful for answered prayer that's evident among us this morning. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to meet with those of like precious faith. Father, may we be robed in white in thy sight, forgiven of anything amiss in our lives so that we may worship thee acceptably this day. You'd be pleased with our worship. We can edify one another. For those that have a public part in our worship, Father, we ask that you be with them. 
May they prepare themselves in themselves in such a way that they may say or do those things most needful for us at this time. We pray that thy name will be glorified in our worship today. Father, continue to watch over and care for us. Forgive us when we fail thee. May we always strive to do what's right and be part of the glorious church at Bremen here. And may it be unspotted from the world. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. May we continue our worship now and stand and sing number two. Oh, wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A oh, wonderful Savior to me. He had my soul in the clap of the rock where it is a pleasure I see. He had my soul in the clap of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He had my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock. That shadow of the right dusty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love. And covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his Hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I rise to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, his wonderful love, I shall with the millions on high. Be seated, please. <clears throat> Before the Lord's Supper this morning, number 151. 151. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There, a precious fountain, free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary's mountain. Yeah. 
so thankful for that cross that we just sang about. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you for sending your Son to go down to earth and live a perfect life. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful that he went to that cross on each one of our behalves. Our Heavenly Father, we're so sorry for our sins that put him on that cross. Our Heavenly Father, we know as Isaiah prophesied that Jesus was like a sheep sent unto the slaughter. And Heavenly Father, we're so sorry for that. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we partake of this bread, that each one of our minds go back to that cross and think about the body that was slain on our behalf. We pray this in your beloved Son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. We miss anyone in our survey? Please. Merciful Father in heaven, we're thankful for the structure that you've given humanity to take time out of their daily lives and to remember the cross and the price that was paid there. At this time, we reflect upon the blood of Christ that cleanses all sins for those who are willing to accept it on your terms. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Did we miss anyone in our serving? This concludes the Lord's Supper as another part of worship. We're commanded to give back to God as we've been prospered. After partaking in the Lord's Supper, there's no better time to think about all the blessings that God gives us and to give back to Him as we've been prospered. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for everything you give to us. Our Heavenly Father, as we just finished the Lord's Supper, we know that you gave your only Son on each one of our behalves, and we're so thankful for that. Our Heavenly Father, you give so much to us, both physically and spiritually, and to that we'll be eternally grateful to you for that. Our Heavenly Father, we pray that as we give back, we give back with a cheerful heart. And then, Heavenly Father, we pray that these funds will go to spread your borders of your kingdom. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.
number 641. 641. Once I stood in the night with my head bowed low in the darkness as black as could be. And my heart felt alone and I cried, oh, Father, we thank you for this privilege we have to come here today to worship you. Pray, Heaven, Father, that everything we say and do is in accordance with thy will and pleasing in thy sight. And pray, pray that we will all be edified by this. I, Heavenly Father, thank you for all the many blessings that you so richly and abundantly bless us with each and every day of our lives. And I pray, Heavenly Father, that we will always be mindful that these blessings come from you and you alone. And most of all, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us, for sending your only Son, our only Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to this earth, to down that cruel cross for our sin. Pray, Heavenly Father, we'll try to follow in his path, and that we'll try to be a disciple of Christ each and every day. I, Heavenly Father, pray that you bless those that's been mentioned in announcements, and those that we don't know about, that are sick, that are bereaved, that shut in that requested prayers of the church. Pray you will suit unto them the blessings thou alone know they stand in need of. Pray, Heavenly Father, this time you will bless this nation. Pray that as members of the church that we will rise up and challenge the sinful ways that are taking place in this, in this nation. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you will watch over and protect us, lead us down that narrow path that leads to thee, and at the end, if we've been found faithful, Pray to you comforts and death. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. For the lesson this morning, number 526, let's stand and sing. Number 526, This World Is Not My Home. This is one that I like to sing up tempo. 
Let's lean forward a little bit and let's all keep up. Let's sing out. Verses 1 and 4. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid out somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open door. And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh, Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then, Lord, what will I do? open door, and I can't fit at home in this world anymore. Just up in glory land, we live eternally. The saints on every hand are shining victory. This on the sweetest friend, just back from heaven's shore, and I can't fit at home in this world anymore. friend like you. If heaven's not my home, well then Lord, what will I do? The angels beckon me from heaven's open door, and I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Oh Lord, you know I have no friend like you. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? And I can't feel at home in this world anymore. Amen. Be seated, please. Good morning. Seems, Seems absurd to preach this morning about lifting up Christ standing up there. We are studying, uh, well, we are, our book of the month this month is the book of Numbers. I hope you're getting uh, near the end of that. I am going to plan, Lord willing, uh, next Sunday night to do our book of the month since, of course, the last Sunday night of this month is our gospel meeting. So I wanted to study this morning from the book of Numbers, and uh, I was telling somebody I had a hard time. I knew I wanted to preach from the book of Numbers, and I knew... Uh, I, I, I felt like I probably wanted to preach from Numbers chapter 21, dealing with the brazen serpent, but uh, I just I couldn't exactly figure out how I wanted to approach it. And so a buddy of mine that I went to preacher school with, I, I sent him a message on Facebook, and I said, we were corresponding about something else, and I said, you got anything on the brazen serpent? And he sent me a sermon that I just said, man, I got to preach that. And so, you know, you, you, you tweak a sermon a little bit, you make it your own, but uh, I say that to say, no, I don't want y'all thinking I'm some kind of genius because uh, this, this sermon, it, it's a great, great sermon from Numbers 21, and I appreciate my friend for sharing it with me, and I, I've, I've added my touch to it in some places and personalized it some, but the bulk of this is his material. He calls it uh, the case of the vicious vipers. I think that's a, a very interesting title and very appropriate when you study this passage. Now, when you come to Numbers 21, understand all the way back in Numbers 13 and 14, what happened? Moses sends 12 spies. They go to the land. They come back. They're gone for 40 days, of course. They come back and they say, hey, man, it's just like God said. This place is amazing. I mean, here's the fruit. We've got this big cluster of grapes. The land is amazing. It is a land. It's a Hebrew expression flowing with milk and honey. And we would just say, it's all that. I mean, it's, it's got it all. And they say it's just exactly what God said it is and more. But there's no way we can take that land. We're like grasshoppers in their sight. They're giants. And, of course, two men, Joshua and Caleb, stood up and said, no, don't listen to that. We are well able to take the land. God is with us. He said he's going to give us the land. It doesn't matter that they're giants and we're like grasshoppers on their side. We can take this land. Let's go at once. And the people said, no, no, those other ten guys, they're right. We cannot take this land. And so God says, as you know, all right, you think you're not going into the promised land? You don't believe my promise? It'll be just as you've said. You're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years, a year for each day, the spies were in the land. And your children that you said were going to die out here in the wilderness, 
they're going to inherit the promised land. And so when you come to Numbers 21, approximately 38 years have passed. They've wandered in the wilderness. This generation, this unbelieving generation has died out. 20 years old and upward from the time the spies came back has died out, with the exception, of course, of Joshua, Caleb, Moses, and Aaron. I, actually, I believe Aaron, I have to check that, but uh, Moses obviously is still around at this time, Joshua and Caleb. Now, they got to go through Edom, part of their journey. We're going to go through Edom. And so Moses sends a message to Edom. You know, they're brethren, right? I mean, Jacob and Esau, e Edom came from Esau. And yeah, there was that, that little issue with Jacob and Esau. Not a little issue, it was a big issue. They tricked Isaac, Jacob and Rebekah did, and, and Jacob receives the blessing, and Esau says, well, when my father's dead, I, got, I know what I'm going to do about this. I'm killing him. So Jacob runs for his life. He comes back, he meets up with him later on in the book of Genesis, and of course, what happens? Esau says, hey, I'm, I'm forgiving you. He's forgiven him. But the irony of that is that Esau never, I mean, Edom, the nation as a whole, never forgave Israel. I mean, there was conflict between the Israelites and the Edomites pretty much throughout history. So Moses sends word. We're going to go through your land. We're not going to take anything. We're, we're not going to turn to the right hand or the left. We're going to stick to the road straight in, straight out. That's what we're going to do. Edom says, no, you're not. You come through my land, I'm coming for you, and I'm going to attack you. So now they're going to go a different route. And when you turn to Numbers 21, notice what it says. They journeyed, verse 4, from Mount Hor, that's, um, that's Mount Sinai, by the way of the Red Sea to compass the land of Edom, to, to go around the land of Edom, in other words. They're going around it. And the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Much discouraged. That, that literally could mean, uh, it literally could be translated, it shortened. Shortened because of the way. This people, they've got short tempers, they've got short patience, they've been wandering in the wilderness for 38 years, waiting on their unbelieving older generation to die out. They've had it with this journey to the promised land, this long, drawn-out journey, and now going around. You see, going around Edom meant going through a pretty harsh desert. And so they're shortened. And when you open up, you find Israel, they're complaining again. And you know, you don't have to be a scholar of the book of Numbers to know this is not the first time. It's happened with the older generation. It's happening with this newer generation. They tend to complain. And before we get too hard on them, don't we tend to do the same thing sometimes? So when you come to Numbers 21, you have this incident where they complain again, and God is going to send judgment in the form of fiery serpents. But, you know, we look at this and we say, okay, well, big deal. But there's a message here for us. And it's a message of hope because you and I, we are sinners. We've all sinned. We've complained against God at times. We've complained about God. We've, we've committed other sins. And we're, we are bitten by this disease. And so there's a message in this text of hope for us, even thousands of years later. And, of course, God in his wisdom intended it that way. Let's notice, first of all, Israel's sin. We, we notice verse 4, going into verse 5 of our text. The people spake against God and against Moses. Wherefore have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and our soul loatheth this light bread. Well, Israel commits a sin here. Notice several things that they have rejected. They've turned their backs on here. They've rejected God's person. God himself, in other words. You know, lest we think God is trigger-happy here in Numbers 21, let's just notice a few passages. Go, go back in your Bible to Numbers chapter 11. And, and just look at verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord, and the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed them that were in the uttermost parts of the camp. Well, here they are complaining there. If you go to chapter... 14, and verse 2, all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Would God we had died in the land of Egypt, or would, would God we had died in this wilderness? Go to chapter 16, and verse 
41. But on the morrow, all the congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, saying, Ye have killed the people of the Lord. I mean, over and over, you go to 17.12, they, they do it again. The children of Israel spake unto Moses, saying, Behold, we die, we perish, we all perish. Over and over again, this congregation is complaining. They're complaining all the time. So this is not God just hastily saying, you know, and I, in fact, I even read one writer who's speaking of this passage said, said the people complained again and God had it. I suppose there's a sense in which we could say that, but not in the sense of, you know, think about it, parents, we've all been here before. The kids are going at it, they're carrying on, and, you know, maybe you say, stop doing that, stop doing that, stop doing that, and then you just lose it. You just snap. You say, all right, everybody, to your room, or get out of here, or whatever. You know, you know just, that's it. You snap. That's not God. God's anger is never a passion. It's never an explosion of just unbridled, uncontrolled anger. It's, it's a decision. It's an act of his will. But it's interesting because all along the way is those passages that we've looked at, they're, all, they're complaining against Moses. They're complaining against Moses and Aaron. But here, they complain against God. Their complaint here is against God. They've rejected God's person. And that's never a good thing. Their complaint, it's against God. How arrogant of them. I mean, can you imagine the very idea of puny humans complaining against God? I mean, where was Israel, by the way, before God came along into their situation? Last time I recall, they were slaves. In Ezekiel 16, if we had time, we'd go there. But in Ezekiel 16, God's going to use some very graphic language there to describe to them, here's what your life was like before I came along. And he's painting word pictures there that, that are very strong, but they show how bad off they were before he came along and he saved them and they have the audacity to complain against him now in the wilderness but not only that they rejected his promise where did he say they're going to the promised land they're going to Canaan they've already seen that God means business because 38 years a non-believing generation has died out and God says y'all are going to inherit the promised land and they say, here we are, just going to die in this wilderness. They rejected his promise. They looked him square in the eye, as it were, and they said, we don't believe you. Again, the audacity. They've seen his promises kept time and time and time again. But they reject his promise. They reject his provision. You see the picture here of people gathering manna, they're, they're rejecting the provision of God. Two words here I want you to notice. Loatheth, if you have a King James Version, they loathed, L-O-A-T-H-E-D, the manna. Now this, this word loathe, it's, it carries the idea of to disgust. Manna was God's grace, God's provision for them, right? I think we all understand that. But they, they looked at this manna, this provision of God, this manifestation of God's grace, and they said, man, this stuff is disgusting. Kind of like, you know, sometimes we can do that. Maybe, you know, maybe have children, but we can do it as adults. You got something that, you know, you, you taste it that first time, or two, or 200, and it's pretty good. And then you just say, man, I'm so sick of this. This stuff's disgusting. That's the way they were. I mean, they're sick of it. Give us something else. Our soul loatheth this light, and that's your other word, light bread. That word means worthless. Worthless. Was manna worthless? Far from it. Hey, Israel, where are you without manna? Dead. Dead. They kept them alive for 38 years. And they say, man, this stuff's worthless. And it's disgusting to boot. You see their arrogance, their audacity coming through again? They've rejected God's person. They've rejected his promise. And, and you know, somebody said that when you reject God's word, talking about rejecting his promise, when you, reject God's, when you doubt God's word, you doubt his worth. 
Now Romans 3, 4 says, let God be found true and every man a liar. God is right. God's not, God's not messing around. He's exalted his word above his name, Psalm 138, 2 says. But they rejected his promises. They rejected his provisions. They rejected him himself, his person. But then, of course, you know, they rejected his prophet, Moses. They've turned on Moses as well. And, you know, that just makes sense because when you reject God, you're going to reject God's man every single time. That's why Jesus told his disciples in John 15, if the world hates you, know that it hated me first. If they hate me, they're going to hate you. If you're a follower of Jesus and the world hates Jesus, then guess what? They're going to hate you. Light and darkness don't go together. Bitter and sweet don't go together. We've been studying James in Sunday morning Bible class, and James is going to talk about that when we get to chapter 3. The world's not going to like followers of Jesus because the world doesn't like Jesus. So you see Israel's sin. But then you come to Israel's sentence. They're going to find out really quickly that God's not messing around. I found that picture to go with this, and it just it creeps me out every time I look at it. I don't like snakes. You know, my, my friend that I go camping with, he's a, he, he tells me sometimes, he said, well, that's a good snake. I said, there is no good snake except a dead snake. That's a good snake. Uh, I don't know what that's supposed to mean, a good snake. I mean, I know what he means, but, you know, as long as it's away from me, it can be a good snake. But if it's near me, the good snake is the dead snake. But so, so when I come to Numbers 21, I read about this sentence from God. Uh, it's got special meaning to me. I mean, it just kind of gives me chills every time I'm thinking about it. Because snakes are just something that I don't care for at all. But verse 6, it says, The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much people of Israel died. Here comes the sentence. And, and this sentence for Israel, we're, we're going to notice several things about it. Number one, it was deserved. They deserved this sentence. This is not something, again, God acting hastily. This is not God just losing his temper over and over they have complained. They have seen God acting. They've seen that he means what he says. They continue to test him. And so God, he acts. This sentence was deserved. They had multiplied murmurings in the wilderness. But not only that, it was, it was dreadful. I mean, these are fiery serpents. There, most, most scholars think that's a reference to probably how it felt immediately after getting bit. It's burning sensation. In fact, I want to go to something right here. I found this, general symptoms of a snake bite. Of course, different snake bites do different things depending on how poisonous a snake is or you know, is it poison enough to kill you, things like that. But you've got all kinds of problems going on. Here, you know, here's your, your wound site. You're going to have bleeding fang marks, discoloration, it's going to burn. There's a burning sensation. Swelling, you're going to begin swelling. In fact, uh, looking at, for symptoms of a snake bite on a Google search, on Google Images will show you some things that just make you cringe, uh, some of the swelling and all. You're going to have respiratory problems, breathing difficulty. You may have systemic issues, fever, severe pain, central nervous system issues. Depending on the type of snake, you can have dizziness, fainting, increased thirst, headaches, your vision goes blurry. And by the way, boy, I wish we had more time. We could talk about all this and how it relates to the bite of sin and how it affects us spiritually. But uh, the heart and the blood vessels, you, your pulse increases rapidly. Blood pressure drops. Severe shock many times. And, and again, some of this depends on the particular type of snake. Muscular issues, you may have muscle convulsions, loss of coordination, weakness in the muscles. You may experience nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. Other skin sites, there may be bleeding spots, numbness, tingling, sweating. Uh, again, if it's a, a hematoxin, you may have issues with blood. I saw one thing, I actually found a little video where it showed a, a guy has this little sample of blood, and it's, it's, it was a fair little bit of blood, and I presume it was human blood, they didn't say for sure. But then they take a snake, and they, I think they call it milking the snake, where they get some of his venom out, and he takes a syringe, and he puts it, it literally looked like about two drops in there, and it was a hematoxin. And that blood that he had in that little petri dish became like jello. You don't want to get bit by a snake. Again, that's why I say, I don't care what kind of snake it is. And people say, oh, that snake's harmless. I don't care. I don't want to be bit by a snake, especially not a poisonous one. This was dreadful. This punishment, this sentence was dreadful. K 
Can you imagine? This is not something, by the way, you die from immediately. They, they tell me there are snakes that will kill you very quickly. This, most scholars suspect, was a, a, some kind of a Middle Eastern viper, and it would not have killed you quickly. It would have been painful. It would have been something that is not an immediate death. It's not a way you want to go, folks. And people tell me, people want you to believe being a Christian is hard. That's what the devil says. Oh, man, it's too hard to be a Christian. This is a picture of sin, folks. Jesus says, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. Matthew 11, verse 30. Proverbs 13, 15 tells us the way of sinners, the way of transgressors is hard. Last part of that verse. Psalm 9, 17 says, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. Don't tell me being a Christian is hard. It's a lot better than this kind of thing. I mean, this is a physical picture of what sin does to us spiritually. God wants us to know here in this dreadful sentence that suffering and death, they follow sin just as surely as night follows day. That's what God wants us to see here. Suffering and death, they go with sin. They run together. It's going to follow just as sure as night follows day. But you know, this sentence was also deadly. You didn't recover once you got bitten by one of these serpents. You aren't going to wait it out. You aren't going to find the right ointment or the right potion or whatever to take. You were going to die. That was, that was the sentence. You see, that's what sin does. Sin thrills, and then it kills. Hebrews 11.25, Moses talked about, or the Hebrews writer talking about Moses said he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Sin often is pleasurable, but it's just for a season. You see, it kills. James 1 tells us that. We've been studying James, and James says... Every man is drawn away of his own temptation, of his own lust, and enticed. And when lust hath conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, when it's full grown, it brings forth death. That's the end result of sin. You're not going to get around that. That's the result of sin. Wages of sin is death. Romans 6.23. That's just what sin does. It kills. And we need to understand that. This sentence was deadly. You know, they didn't have a hospital. But there was no hospital big enough to hold all the people anyways. You're talking two to four million people in a 12, about a 12 square mile area. They didn't have a hospital, but even if they did, it wouldn't have mattered because they'd, they'd had run out of beds very quickly. Didn't have a doctor. Didn't matter because there'd be too many patients for that doctor anyways. No anti-venom. Wouldn't have been enough to go around anyways. It's a desperate situation. Folks, that's a picture of lost sinners, if ever there were one. Hopeless, helpless. There's nothing you can do. You cannot save yourself. That's a picture of us. These people bitten by the serpent. That's the sentence that God gives. But then we notice in verse, verse 7, Israel's sorrow. We're going to see Israel's sorrow here. Notice verse 7. Therefore the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against thee. Pray unto the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people. Well, here you see three things that are necessary in order to do something about sin. You know, you get bit by a snake, you can lay there and die. You're out in the woods maybe and you get bit by a rattlesnake or maybe you come across a copperhead and get bit. Those are poisonous snakes around here. and You can lay there and you can die or you can do something about it. Well, doing something about the bite of sin, there's three things that have to happen. There's conviction. They say, we have sinned. And until you come to the point where you say, I have sinned, there's nothing that can be done. You, you are hopeless. But they come to a point, they say, we have sinned. They understand what we've done here is wrong. They're not trying to gloss over it or justify it. They say, look, there's, there's nothing else we can say. We messed up. We sinned. There's confession. They, they say, along with we have sinned, they say, we've spoken against the Lord and against you. They acknowledge what they've done. They say, you know, of course, conviction almost forces confession. If you really are convicted of sin, you confess. Well, what I've done here is I've sinned against God. That's what Joseph said on one occasion. Remember, how can I do this great thing and sin against God? Well, he was sinning against Potiphar. If he had done that, he would have sinned against Potiphar and many other people. But he understood ultimately the sin was against God. And then, of course, there's contrition. 
This is the idea that realizing, you know, conviction is great and that leads us to confessing, but you got to realize that I can do nothing about that sin. These people realized we're going to die. They didn't start say, saying, quick, somebody start researching. Cut open one of those snakes and let's see if we can figure out what makes this uh, venom work. And if we could come up with an anti-venom real quick before any more people die. They understood nothing was going to cure that. They wouldn't have come up with any anti-venom. It wouldn't have worked. Their hope was in God. And it's still just as true today. We've got to understand that we've committed sin. We're sinners. We've got to understand... We've got to confess that we have committed sins, that we are in need of a Savior. And then we've got to understand through contrition that God is our only hope. So you see Israel's sorrow. And then finally, thankfully the story doesn't end there because you have Israel's salvation. Look at verse 8. The Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. You know, the cure didn't come in the form of a pill or a potion. It came, strangely enough, in the form of a brass serpent on a pole. It seems strange that the very thing that was causing them this problem is what ended up being their salvation, this serpent lifted up on a pole. But in that serpent, you see a picture of guilt, if brass represents judgment over and over again in the, in the uh, Bible. You see, in fact, you remember a few weeks ago we looked at, well, I guess it was a few months ago, we looked at the resurrected Christ, the glorified Christ in Revelation 1. We talked about his feet of brass, judgment. The, the serpents here picture sin. So you see over and over again there's a picture of guilt. Cursed is everyone that hangs on a tree, Galatians 3.13 says. Again, that looking to Jesus, the, the picture of guilt. But you also see in this, the provision of God. Who, who came up with this plan? Who came up with it? It wasn't, a, it wasn't an Israelite in the camp that said, uh, hey, I got an idea. Let's put a serpent on a pole. God came up with this, folks. This came from God. Again, this provision of God and this picture of guilt reminds us of 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he has made him to be sin, a sin offering for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. You see God's provision in that picture of our guiltiness and Jesus dying for our guiltiness, even though he was innocent. And then I also see in this serpent the power of God's grace. I, I mean, you think about this. This, this cure, this serpent, it, it's infallible. You don't look at the serpent and feel better. You don't say, you know, I, I think I might be a little bit improved, but it's hard to tell. You look and you live. You look at the serpent and you're cured. It, that's infallible. There, there's no getting around that. Jesus say, or Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. You're in Christ, you're healed. You're not getting better. You're not, well, I, I, I hope I'm right with the Lord. And I hope if I died, I would go to heaven. You're healed. You're in Christ, you're a new creature. Now, I don't think you need me to tell you where you are if you're outside of Christ. This, this cure was infallible. It was individual. You couldn't say, uh, I'm going to let my parents look for me. You couldn't say, well, I'm going to let my children look for me. I'm going to let my wife or my husband look for me. Everybody had to look individually. You couldn't just pass the buck to somebody else. And so it is today, children, parents, spouses, You've got to develop your faith in Almighty God. Nobody can do that for you. You won't go to heaven on somebody else's coattails. This power of God's grace was also instantaneous. You look and you live. There's, there's no waiting. There's no praying, no paying. You look and you live. And folks, salvation is just as readily available today you come to Jesus Christ turning away from your sins. You confess his name as Lord. Romans 6, 3, and 4 talks about being buried with him in baptism. It's reenacting, reenacting the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ through obeying the gospel. We're buried. We, we die to sin. We're buried in the water of the grave. We're raised to walk in newness of life. And it's immediate. It, it's not that God says, well, we're going to give you a trial period. 
I'll check back with you in 90 days. We'll see how you're doing. God says you are forgiven. You're healed. You look, you live. That's still just true today. When I come to God on his terms, I can live. And folks, it's invaluable. It was free, it was available, sufficient. It's readily available to anybody. It's right there, the serpent's on a pole, and all you've got to do is look. Reminds us of Revelation twenty-two seventeen, 17, doesn't it? If you're thirsty, if you hear, come. Whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. Folks, today we need, we need to lift up Jesus. You see, that's, that's the picture here. Turn over in your Bibles to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Notice verses 14 and 15. And as Moses, Jesus speaking, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. And you know verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now get this. People are dying. Go back to the scene there in Numbers 21. People are dying right and left. I mean, it's a funeral everywhere you look. They're digging graves. They're putting bodies in them. And they're weeping, still mourning over someone. Or, or maybe they're crying over someone who's just at the point of death. And a cry goes up. There's a cure. A cure is available. And so a man is healed. He looks at the snake. And he comes and he runs to a tent of his neighbor. And he says, come look at the serpent. Look at the brazen serpent and live. And a man says... Appreciate your concern, buddy, but I'm, I'm too far gone. Not even that serpent can help me. Uh, my condition's so bad. And so the man runs to the next tent, and he says, there's a cure, look and live. And he says, I, I, I'm going to get some things straightened out. And then I'll come, and I'll, I'll step outside, and I'll look at that serpent and live. The man shakes his head, and he goes to the next tent, and he says, there's a cure, come out here and look and live. And, and that fellow says, I, I don't believe in this connection between the serpent and being healed. I mean, I, I've heard some of you people talk about that, but there is no connection in that. God will heal me. But, but there's a serpent. God told Moses to put the serpent on the rock. Don't try to tell me all that. God's going to save me. I don't see any connection there. And you go to the next step. Look and live. And the guy says, well, you know, there's some things I'd have to give up if I do that. And I don't know about that. I'm, I'm, I think I'm content where I am. Man, you're dying. I'm, I'm good. I appreciate your concern, though. We'd say that man's a fool. All of those people. And you know people do it all the time today. You tell somebody, here's what you need to do. You need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they say, oh, I'm too bad. You just don't know what I've done. I don't know what you've done. I don't care. It doesn't matter. You come to Jesus, he'll save you. Somebody says, well, you know, I'd have to give up some things in my life that I like to do. So you'd rather just sit there and die and be lost in a devil's hell forever? Somebody says, well, you know, uh, I'm going to get some things right in my life. Hey, if we could get some things right in our life, we wouldn't need a Savior. Jesus says to those who are in sin, come to me. I came to call... The sinners to repentance. But we sit there and we say, well, you know, and sometimes somebody might say, can you imagine a guy in his tent saying, well, you know, I'm not bit as bad as somebody over here down the, I mean, look at the guy three tents down. He's much worse than I am. I mean, he got bit twice. I'm not as bad as some of the elders of the congregation. How silly. But people do it. They'll sometimes even look to somebody in the church and, you know, maybe that person's not what they ought to be. But how foolish could I be to say, look at that person. He's he worse than me. I'm sitting here dying of my wound spiritually because we've all been bitten by that serpent's sin. I'm dying, but I say, well, you know, I'm not dying as quickly as so-and-so over here. How foolish. Give up your pride. Look to Jesus. The one that doesn't believe on the Son, Jesus says in John 3, 36, the wrath of God abideth on him. This is, this is a taste this is just a sample of the wrath of God you see in Israel's sentence. I don't want the wrath of God abiding on me. 
I don't even want to taste it, let alone have it abiding on me. Jesus says, if you believe not that I am, you'll die in your sins, John 8, 24. Look to Jesus and live. That's the invitation for you this morning if you're not a child of God. Brothers and sisters in Christ, we've got to lift up Jesus. Can you imagine going back to that scene? I mean, here's, here's somebody and, and, and a man rushes into the tent and here's a mother and she's stooped over her child as the child is dying, nearing death's door. And the man rushes in and he says, there's, there's a cure. Come on. And she takes that child who can't even walk. What does she do? She doesn't say, well, he can't walk. He doesn't look very interested. She picks him up. She takes him out. Gets him where he can be in view of that brazen serpent. She doesn't say, well, he, he doesn't, I don't think he's even interested. He's not even looking. She turns that child's head. She pries the eye open and she says, son, look. Look and live. And his eyes open and he looks and he's healed. Has that ever happened to you? That's happened to me. I was dead, lost, hopeless, and I looked to Jesus. And I was saved. And if that's happened to you, you'll want that for others. Let's lift up Jesus. We've got a great opportunity coming in a couple of weeks to lift up Jesus and say to others, look and live. Give up your pride. Come to Jesus. He'll save you as we stand and sing. If you give your heart to Jesus, He will make it white as snow. Come to Jesus, 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 come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come, come today. Come to Jesus, do not tarry. Enter in at mercy's gate. Who oh, delay not till thou morrow, lest thy coming be too Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come, come today. Come to Jesus, dying sinner. Other Savior, there is none. He will share with you His glory when your pilgrimage is done. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come today. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus, come to Jesus, come, come today. Closing song this morning will be number 305, 305. Before the closing prayer, before the closing prayer, after the closing song, we'll sit down and we'll have a presentation. And... Uh, then I'll have another announcement after that about that. Let's sing verse 1 of Anywhere's Home. If you have filled out an attendance card, go ahead and pass that to the center aisle. It'll be uh, picked up as we sing the closing song. Earthly wealth and pain may never come to me and
thank Chad for an excellent lesson. I'd ask you for just a moment, if you would please, to give heed to Brother Robert Edwards. He approached us last week upon his receipt of the Jim Waldron newsletter. Many of you may receive that as well. But if you've had opportunity to read through it, it was a very emphatic story that Robert wishes to bring to our attention. We wish to tell you that the elders have, will make a decision to appropriate some money for this cause that Robert will present to you in just a moment. But at this time, I'd like to ask Brother Robert to come and make his presentation. This is dated from Jim Waldron's newsletter, April 2014. The title of it is The True Cost of Discipleship. What does it take to be a Christian? What does it take to be a disciple of Christ when it means leaving a parental religion? What does it really take to renounce a former religious affiliation? Jim writes, these are just a few of the questions that have marched madly in my mind over the last few days since that unforgettable day when one of our sisters in Christ was beaten to death by her husband. Because she refused to renounce her faith in Christ as our Lord and Savior. Let me take this struggle to a different level. What is the life of a Christian whose husband is not a Christian? Although I thought about Christians who had to leave religions and denominations, my thoughts on this issue were rekindled because of the death of our beloved sister, Savithra. My thoughts are presently on other Christian women who have non-Christian husbands. It's one thing to have a husband who is indifferent or even cooperative yet uninterested as to where their wife is on Sunday and Wednesday. But it's a totally different scenario for a sister who has a husband with a hostile disposition toward religious preference. This is the group to which our dear sister belonged during her life on earth. This sister who suffered for the cause of her faith stood tall with courage, conviction, and backbone, defending the one who washed away her sins and promised her eternal life. Through the beatings when death was teasing her relentlessly, and Satan enticing her to compromise for just once, she put to shame and defeated Satan by embracing her Lord to the last breath of her life. Revelations 2 and verse 10 says, Be thou faithful unto death, and I'll give thee a crown of life. He writes, She did not fear the one who was able to kill her body, but joyfully adhered to the one who had power to redeem her soul. At the end of this ordeal, our sister surrendered herself fully to the Lord in death, entrusting the children of her, to her spiritual family and turned her husband over to the judgment bar of Christ. He is presently under arrest. She understood the true cost of his discipleship and was willing to pay the cost no matter what. In doing so, she put herself in a great company of martyrs like Stephen, in the apostles and innumerable other early Christians. For they stood for their faith in spite of extreme pressures to renounce the Lord of Lord and King of Kings. He writes, what fortitude, what conviction. She was willing to be dedicated to her cause, the cause of Christ. May we be an encouragement to our fellow Christians, gladly bearing their burdens, Galatians 6 and verse 2 teaches us. Our sister had given her children the name Yeshu, which, in G which means in her language, Jesus. This she did to tell an unbelieving world that her babies belonged to Jesus. They are being taken care of by the local church. Her life is a great motivation to all of us. Her husband's family is now threatening that same fate, death, to anyone that converts to Hinduism, from Hinduism. He writes, we have set up a fund to help these children. We can never bring back their mother 
We want to make sure they get to be with her in that eternal bliss. And he ended it, if you can help, let me know. Chad has been teaching us from the book of James. It said, be ye doers. Excuse me. Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. He also taught us even this morning, pure religion and undeviled before God the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. Paul wrote in Romans 15 and verse 1, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Luke encouraged us in Acts 20 and verse 35, I have showed you all things, how that so laboring you ought to support the weak, and to remember the words of our Lord, how he said it is more blessed to give than receive. I call upon the church today to search your hearts on the behalf of these dear children, Yesi Babu and Yesi Manny. If you find it in your heart, you can make your check write, uh, and write it out to the Church of Christ and in the memo block, write Waldron's Children's Fund. Fun. Thank you. Thank you, Robert, for bringing that to our attention. What a wonderful effort to help these children and what a wonderful testimony this woman has for us. We'll have a prayer in just a moment and be dismissed. Please remember the egg hunt this uh, directly after services. Also, the picture for the lads, the leaders, participants, which we will have down here at the uh, front of the auditorium. Uh, practice today includes the banner participants at 3 o'clock, everybody else at 4 o'clock, and we're going to have some administrative stuff to take care of, getting our songs and everything ready. If we have time for practices of speeches or songs or Bible reading, we will, we will work that in uh, along with the banner and everything else we're doing. But 3 for banner, 4 o'clock for everyone else, and we certainly look forward to our competition coming uh, this weekend. If there's nothing else, we'll stand and be dismissed with a prayer. Oh, sorry. And also, Melanie has the t-shirts. See her. Uh, you can uh, pay for and get your t-shirt. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for this day that you've allowed us to come here and gather around your table to remember the death of Jesus on that cruel cross. Dear Lord, we're thankful for this beautiful day, all the blessings that you bestow unto us each and every day that we take for granted too often. Dear Lord, we pray for the church worldwide at this time. We pray for strength that we can be the kind of people that we need to be. Dear Lord, we, we pray for strength and we pray for your guidance. Dear Lord, we're th so thankful for your word, for the guidance it gives us each and every day. And we're thankful most of all for your love, your love that sent Jesus to earth to die on that cruel cross so that we can go to heaven. Dear Lord, we, we pray a special blessing on the church that meets here at Bremen. Pray that we would be what you would have us to be. Dear Lord, we, we are so thankful for the avenue of prayer so that we can, we can bring our petitions to you and that we know that you will listen to us. Dear Lord, we, we, pray, for, we pray for our brothers and sisters around the world that are going through such hardships as the one we just heard about. Dear Lord, we, we pray that we will be the right kind of brothers and sisters that we need to be to Christians here, but not only here, but also the world over. Dear Lord, we pray that you will bless the children. Dear Lord, please go with us today and, and guide, guard, and direct us. And if you see fit, bring us back at the next point in time. In Jesus' name, amen.